Okay, so we've seen something about cDNAs. We've been given examples of them and what they look like. Today we're going to actually talk about how they are made and how they are used for cloning purposes. So why clone cDNAs? Well, mostly because then we can focus on the part of the protein that we're interested in, sometimes at least, which is that encoding the protein. We were starting off with a mammalian gene. We will produce, of course, a pre-mRNA that needs to be spliced, capped, and polyadenylated before it can then be exported to the cytosol for translation. So the final mRNA has all the amino acids encoded in it, but without the introns and without the promoter. So it's ready to go as far as protein synthesis is concerned. But we need to know then how we would create such a molecule, beginning with this mRNA, the DNA form of this molecule, so that such a thing can be cloned. Okay, so they are, reminding you, cDNA are DNA copies of mature RNAs. They're made enzymatically and then cloned into plasmid vectors. Okay, so the idea is that the cDNA is the DNA version of the mRNA sequence, but it's without its introns and without its promoter. So it's got whatever's left over after splicing has occurred. Okay, so <clears throat> cDNAs are made using reverse transcriptase to make a DNA copy of the mRNA. Okay, so we know what DNA polymerases do. They make DNA, but they cannot use RNA templates. They can only use DNA templates. So we need a reverse transcriptase to perform that reaction for us. So these are RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, and they're the ones we use in lab are made from retroviruses that use this as a, cr a critical part of their life cycle. Okay, the reverse transcriptases are like DNA polymerases in many ways, in that they require primers to start the reaction, but we can do that. We can add oligonucleotides to our mRNA to provide primers. We also, of course, need nucleotides, and those can easy, easily be provided as well. Okay, just a little bit more about reverse transcriptases. We'll be hearing more about these later in the class. They synthesize DNA using RNA as templates. Okay, so like retroviruses like HIV, include these as a critical part of their life cycle. In those viruses, the virion, which is the infectious particle, contains a genomic linked RNA, which needs to be trans reverse transcribed to form DNA as part of the life cycle in which the virus will then produce new virus particles to replicate itself. So these are the reverse transcriptases that we normally use experimentally. But it's kind of interesting to think at the moment that we actually have our own reverse transcriptases in our genome. We're familiar with the idea of telomerase, whose job it is to extend the ends of chromosomes at, 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 to prevent shortening of chromosomes after replication. Well, think about telomerase. It has its own RNA template, which serves as a template for extension of the DNA in that setting. Okay, you might not realize that we have a lot, a lot of retrotransposons in our genome and the famous, well, the most prevalent one being L1. And this transposon is capable of moving around our genome, and it does that by synthesizing an RNA copy of itself. It's sitting there in the genome in its DNA form, and if it's going to move around the genome or insert itself at a new lo location, it does that. The first step in that is synthesizing an RNA copy of itself, which will then be copied by reverse transcriptase to insert itself at, at a new location. Now, this particular reverse transcriptase is encoded by the L1 itself. And finally, we have the human endogenous retroviruses. And these are weird and kind of creepy if you think about it. These are remnants of retroviruses that inserted themselves into our genome a long time ago. They're inactive in the sense they don't produce retroviruses generally, um, but they do have, in some cases, reverse transcriptase genes that are still recognizable in their, by their sequence. Okay, so this is an um, ad for a kit which is sold to do this, and it's intended for polyadenylated RNA, a pool of polyadenylated RNA, in which all the mRNA molecules end with a poly A tail. And so we're going to use these mRNAs in this collection of mRNAs to create double-stranded cDNAs that then we can use for cloning purposes. Okay, so the first step is going to be the first strand synthesis which uses an oligo-DT primer. So this takes advantage of the fact that the mRNA ends with a series of A's, 
that is three prime end. And so we can just use an oligo DT in the form of DNA to prime synthesis of that first strand. So what happens is we add the reverse transcriptase and it goes ahead and uses the mRNA as a template to create the first strand of the cDNA, which is complementary to the RNA template. Okay, so we need to have our template, a reverse transcriptase, our primer. Okay, the next step in this is going to be used, we need to synthesize a second strand, and that's a lot more difficult. Okay, so in this particular setting, what we do is we add a little bit of RNase H, and what it does is it partially digests or makes NICs all along the original mRNA strand. So that's an important part of the process because we need to pr make primers in order to synthesize the second strand of DNA. And those three prime hydroxyls that are exposed in response to the RNA's digestion will serve as primers for our second strand synthesis. Okay, so the first reaction gives us a hybrid molecule in which one strand is the original mRNA and the other is a single strand of DNA. So in synthesizing the second strand, we're going to start by making NICs in the original RNA to pro provide primers that we can do that process. Okay, so our RNAs H is going to make little NICs along the mRNA all along its length, and that's going to provide primers for synthesis of the second strand. And for that purpose, we're going to use the DNA polymerase from E. coli because it has some useful properties for this particular purpose. Okay, so we're going to synthesize, um, we're going to have, we have um, sequences that are five prime to the NICs. Those can serve as primers. But remember, DNA polymerase one from E. coli has not just DNA polymerase activity, it has a five prime to three prime exonuclease activity. And that's going to be important for this particular reaction. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the three prime hydroxyls in the RNA to serve as primers. And of course, the template is going to be the first strand of DNA that was made. Importantly, we're going to use the five prime to three prime exo activity that DNA Pol one has, because what it's able to do is chop out nucleotides successively ahead of itself as while, while it is filling in with DNA as it goes along. So it can chew out ahead of itself, replacing the RNA with DNA, and then create basically the second strand of DNA. That le leads to replacement uh, with DNA of the original RNA. Okay, now we're still gonna have NICs in the DNA because DNA polymerase can't seal NICs. We need DNA ligase for that purpose. Okay, so once we've done our NIC sealing reaction, we have double-stranded cDNA, but we still have some single-stranded bits on the ends, and we're going to remove these with DNA polymerase, which has a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity, and that's going to ultimately blunt our molecule and make it ready to clone. Okay, for your information, there are many companies that sell lots and lots of cDNAs, and it's rare that people actually have to make their own. So that's a convenience, because this is actually not a very easy process at all. Okay, so now we want to clone our cDNA. And there are many ways to go about this, but we're going to choose add-on PCR as one simple example. Okay, so the problem is our cDNA is double-stranded, but it's blunt-ended. And suppose we want to use a restriction enzyme cut plasmid so that we can attach the DNA to the vector. Well, we don't have a site on the end because it's blunt. And moreover, we have the possible problem that the cDNA itself might contain sites for any enzyme. So one thing you have to do to start out with is pick an enzyme that's not present within the cDNA for cloning purposes. So what we're going to do is use PCR to add the selected restriction site of choice, our choice, to the end of this blunt-ended cDNA. So we're going to use PCR to add these sequences to the ends. And this is actually an outrageously simple thing to do. Okay, so this is representing what's going to happen. I'm going to have a couple of slides where it actually shows some of the steps in the process so it makes more sense. Okay, so our gene of interest here is actually our double-stranded cDNA. And this is very representational because it shows both primers, but it, it shows what they're eventually going to do. Okay, so look at the forward primer. It has sequences at its three prime ends, which are going to, of course, anneal to the strand that we're trying to copy. 
which would be the lower strand in this case. And we're going to then be able to extend that primer in a usual sort of PCR reaction. But the polymerases don't care what's attached to this particular primer that we're using. We're not just going to use the part that anneals to the gene of interest. We're going to add a few extra nucleotides upstream of it, or 5 prime to it, which contains the restriction site that we're interested in using. Then we have to include about five or so more base pairs because restriction enzymes don't like to cut on the extreme ends of molecules. So we're going to put the extra base pairs on there just to make the restriction enzyme reaction more efficient later. Okay. And we're going to do the same, same thing with the reverse primer. We're going to have a region of it at a 3' end that anneals to the template. We're going to include a restriction site, which can, can be or doesn't have to be the same as the one in the forward primer and then a few extra nucleotides to make it so that the restriction enzyme can work efficiently. Okay, so this is what I just said. We have extra nucleotides at the five prime ends of the primers, and we will include a restriction sequence, a few extra nucleotides, and the part of the primer which actually anneals to the template, which is going to get our reaction going for us. All right, we certainly need that part of it. Okay, this represents what it ultimately looks like, but it's a little hard to sort of see that unless you like look at some of the steps in the reaction. But the idea is, of course, we've had a forward primer, which has a few extra nucleotides, a reverse primer with a few extra nucleotides, and ultimately what you end up is a fully double-stranded molecule with those originals it added on restriction sequences and their complements as part of a double-stranded molecule. So in terms of following what's going on here, I'm simply starting off with the lower strand, and I've shown in green the 5' prime end, which has the region that anneals to the template strand, plus a few extra nucleotides. So the first product of that reaction will be an um, elongated form of it, right? That primer is going to be used to extend and copy the original template strand, which has no add-ons. But that does give us a single strand with extra nucleotides at its 5' prime end, and that's going to start the process. Now we're going to take a couple more cycles before we have a fully double-stranded product with the sites on the ends, but this is an important first step. Okay, what happens next is we get a molecule, which will then serve as template, of course, um, that contains the additional nucleotides at both of its ends. Right, so the molecule we just made is shown at the bottom, the lower strand, and it's got a extra nucleotides at its 5' prime end that we added on, and it extends to the 3' prime end, which contains just a normal template with no extra nucleotides. But this molecule is then going to serve as a template in the next round of reaction, and it will, of course, bind to the other primer, the reverse primer, which contains extra nucleotides at its 5' prime end, plus, of course, a region that anneals to the template. Now, the result of that reaction, we will have a long molecule with an extension at one end, but importantly with restriction sites or their complements on both ends. So that molecule has the complement of the original add-on nucleotides at one end and a stretch at its own 5' prime end, which contains the other primer and its associated restriction enzyme sites. So now when that molecule starts serving as template, you will get the full-length double-stranded product that has restriction sites and added on nucleotides at both of its ends. And that molecule will, of course, continue um, and it will take over the reaction, leading to the formation of the desired product, something with restriction sites on both ends that we can then use for cloning purposes. So that's what it looks like. We have full add-on product at both ends, and that's ready to be cut with the restriction enzyme and then cloned. Okay, so here's what it looks like. We would have our, for example, ECOR1 at both ends. We've added on our GAATTCC, the X's are those extra nucleotides we put on for the efficiency of the reaction. We have our insert, which is double-stranded DNA that was formed from the RNA, so that's our cDNA sequence. And of course, if we cut this with ECOR1, we will form the sticky ends that we need, 5' prime sticky ends, for ligation purposes to a compatible end on a plasmid, presumably an ECOR1 cut plasmid. 